right, everybody, everybody, it's your main man, Anthony Brompton. I'm coming at you once again, and I got a smooth dude on the channel. <laughs> this guy is smoother. He almost is, yeah, he about as smooth as I am. How about that? <laughs> yes, sir. And he liked that black history. Oh, yes. man, this guy has written a book on it. He talking about it. He's sharing it with people, and he wants to share it with you, my viewers. <laughs> you know, I'm Anthony Brogdon, and I'm coming at you straight, no chaser. The train has left the station. There are some intelligent, some really good people that have come on the channel, and this gentleman is just another one of them. I am lucky to find him. Don't know how it happened. And I'm, oh my God, I, I'm telling you, we he and I talk a, a few times. He'd be like, man, I got some more. I said, I said, man, this one don't wait to get to the channel. <laughs> he said, I got stuff to tell you, brother. I'm so excited. And I guess what that means to you, my friends, is this. Uh, I think people like what I'm doing. People like this, what, you know, because I let the people do the talking. And that, you know, I've been interviewed myself uh, a few times and it seemed like the interviewer talks longer than I did. I try not to do that. I want them to tell the story. So do this, hit the subscribe button on this channel. It's free. There's no channel out there like Strong Inspirations, not bringing you this kind of content. Hit the like button on this video because you're going to like it. My man got a backdrop. <laughs> he that serious. He ain't joking. He got a backdrop. <laughs> Uh, so like this video, hit the notifications bell, because when the videos come up, and I'm doing four or five videos a week, I, let me tell you, my friends, all I do is put a tad edit on it, just a little bit, some stuff in the description most times, and then I want you to have it, but I got to stagnate, because my heart tells me, put one out. Now, I don't want to put it out no certain times, certain days, so hit the uh, notifications bell so you can do it. Tell somebody about strong inspirations. All you got to do is tell them, say, hey, man, uh, 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 check out strong inspiration on YouTube. You ain't got to say no more. Just tell them, check it out. And then they hooked, because I think you hooked. Um, all right. Uh, let me just, let me, uh, man, let me share this with you. Did y'all see the video I got with the guy who found out that his great grandfather was in the KKK? He wow. said that one day he was teaching black kids too. Uh, the white, his family was racist. He, he admits that. He said, I was teaching black kids down in, uh, I think it was in Arkansas or something like that. That's where he's from. And I got jumped by some white kids. They were beating me up. And another white kid, this is a white guy that's telling the story. And another white kid jumped in, not kid, these, these adults, you know, grown people, 30s and 40s and whatnot. And another one jumped in the middle and said, this is, it ain't no more going to happen here. And he wrote a book about it. Watch that video. Did you see the one where they had the guy, his grandfather at the tree with the rope on his neck and they let him go? My man escaped ran through the woods and ended up out of Troy, Alabama, here in Detroit. Watch that video. Did you see the one where the guy says his great, great grandfather was one of the last slaves to be brought to America on that boat called the Catilda? Watch that video. And I can go on and on. I got over 270 of them on here. We jamming, everybody. So check them out. Uh, I want y'all to come to my festival. I got my own Black History Festival in Kansas City, Kansas. My own. And I'm telling you, it's going to be well organized. When you get there, we're going to tell you we got a welcome center. We're going to tell you where we what everything is. We got literature. We got a, we, I, I'm, a, I'm trying to get an app. <laughs> I'm going to have me my own app so you can just app it and know where to go. But it, 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 and I, I, I'm putting everything together now. And I found the drummers. I found the people to cook the food. Now, I'm not talking about caterers. I'm talking about these neighbors, this grandma and, and them people going to do the grilling. 
So it's called the Freedom Quindaro. Uh, I want it's Memorial Day weekend. Uh, everybody, if, if you don't know, I'm a filmmaker. I'm that thorough. This is a documentary that I've done called Business in the Black, The Rise of Black Business in America. It's streaming on Amazon. Please uh, watch it there. I, I showed it in 40 cities. Some I had big crowds, some I had little crowds. But I was like, I got to get this information out. Read my book. It's called Black Business Book. It's got over 200 facts. It, ooh, man, there's stuff in here I know you don't know. I didn't know it. And when I found it, and I'm going to tell you the truth, I just kind of Googled some stuff. And it led to other stuff and other stuff. And I said, oh, man, put this in a book. This was after the movie. I'm going even deeper. And here we go. It's not a big book. Easy read. Not expensive. Get you a copy of Black Business Book. Go to my website where you can see that and about my uh, about the uh, documentary on there and also about uh, the Black History Festival and some other things I'm doing at businessintheblack.net. Just go there, my friends. Now, <clears throat> uh, you hear me use this term strong a lot. I've been saying it. I say it on all my videos because all my guests fit this bill. Strong stands for strength, tenacity, resilience, and a sense of oneness, nobility, and grace. And that is my introduction to my guest today. He's a strong brother. He's sitting there while he listening to me. He writing down some stuff. I mean, let me tell how serious are you? Oh my God. He right now. He's I got a thought and he's writing it down. Strong man, introduce yourself. Thank you for coming on the channel. I, I gotta ask a couple questions of you. I, I do this with all my guests. Well, where are you, you know from what? originally? Originally from Oakland, California. Do you uh uh Oakland? How do you know how your folks got to Oakland? Uh yeah, yeah. Well, my my uh my mom's dad, okay, uh migrated from New Orleans, and his brother had already come from New Orleans and was working at Sunshine Biscuit and Bacon Company. And so my Oakland. grandfather came out from New Orleans. My mom's mother migrated from New York. My dad's uh, uh, family migrated from Texas. And uh, I think primarily one being the military, uh, Oakland was a big military base. Yeah. And two, uh, being in shipbuilding. Right. So a combination of things gra gravitated, the two families gravitated from New Orleans and New York out uh, to Oakland. The, yeah. the, now that's a long way from, uh, you know, the South and that kind of thing. Uh, they, they uh, and I, I'm sure they had airplanes, but you think they 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 just drove out there? Do you, you know uh, how they, they track? They just they just kind of piecemeal their way out there. I mean, you know, I mean, you were not getting on no airplanes. Yeah, and, oh, wasn't, really? and wasn't getting on a lot of trains at that time. Oh, no, really? Wasn't getting on a lot of trains, but uh, they made their way out. Uh, and uh, my grandfather, um, uh, after he finished the military. Uh, opened up a cafe. He worked at the post office during the day, and he opened up a cafe called Al's Cafe. Okay. And in Oakland, whenever the military come in, there two places that they, uh, the black soldiers would socialize, and one would be Al's Cafe, and another ca uh, another location would be Slim Jenkins. Okay. So if anybody know anything about Oakland in the 50s and the early 60s, they know Al's Cafe. My mom was the chili and spaghetti cooker and my grandfather beer and wine yeah oh, i love it now, now it, was, um, it, it is entrepreneur yeah i love it so now uh oakland what was the black neighborhood in oakland what was it called well let's say this it was peralta but see oakland is one of those cities like a lot of cities let's say this when you start in west oakland that means you have started in the flatland as west oakland now, when things get a little better, or, or how can I say, moving on up, then you would migrate to North Oakland. And boy, I tell you, when things got a little better, you'd migrate to East Oakland. So that's how the migration took place in Oakland, all right? And uh, I was raised pretty much in my early elementary school years in West Oakland, uh, went to Cole Elementary School, and then went to uh, Lowell Junior High, and then uh, moved out to East Oakland. Let me yeah. ask you this: Where you where, in your early days? 
was your neighborhood predominantly black and you went to school, an all black school? Well, uh, in my, uh, in elementary school and in junior high school primarily, okay. Uh, now high school was a whole different program because um, I have a twin brother and, and three other siblings, two other brothers and a sister who has since passed. Uh, my brother and I were, uh, were baseball players and actually um, were drafted three times to play professionally and end up playing professionally in the minors. But uh, we were supposed to go to a high school, McClyman's High School in West Oakland. McClyman's High School uh, is known uh, for Hall of Fame athletes as uh, Bill Russell uh, with the Celtics, Frank Robinson uh, with the Orioles and the Cincinnati Reds, uh, Beta Pinson, Kurt Flood, Tommy Harper. Really? Really. All those guys uh, were out of that, uh, out of that uh, uh, McClyman's, as well as Kurt Flood. And Kurt Flood okay. was an idol of mine. Yeah, Kurt Flood, yeah. Did, so did yeah. You, did, so the, the school that you go to, was, was it all black or they had whites there too? Well, let's say uh, a few Hispanics and some Portuguese in middle school. But uh, elementary was pretty much all black. Right. Pretty much all black. Now, high school was a little different matter than um, my mom chose that we wouldn't go to McClyman's because we got a scholarship to go to play baseball at a Catholic school in East Oakland. We, okay. had, moved, we had moved from West Oakland, North Oakland, East Oakland. Okay. And I went to St. Elizabeth High School, played baseball there, and okay. ended up going to college on, on right. baseball. I got a couple questions more on this. I hope you don't mind. Yo, you you don't. No, when when, when you was at that high school, did did you did you uh did you relate to the white kids real well? Well, it's kind of interesting. Uh, my mom forced the issue because we were going to McClyman's where all the other athletes. And a little side story about that is uh, when I was uh, uh, very young, I suffered with asthma, and my tw I have an identical twin. And I was kept back because I stayed out of school almost a year in the first grade. So all the way through school up until uh, the ninth grade, I had a twin brother who was a grade ahead of me. So the baseball coach at Mac went to the principal at Lowe's and says, hey, I want these two fellows to come to high school at the same time, do what you need to do. <laughs> so, so I skipped the ninth grade and went right from the ninth grade to the 10th grade. Okay. Oh man. And, <laughs> But now going back to the high school, so now we have to call them and say, hey, we're not coming to the school. We said, well, that's a good idea. He said, no problem. He said, that's great because in the summer you can play for my team. And we end up winning the national championship with his team in the summer. Oh. But St. Elizabeth High School, uh, the first month of the school, my mom didn't know it, but we would get on the bus after school at about 2.33, get on the bus, take it all the way across town, the Keystone bus to McClyman's, hang out with our friends at McClyman's, get okay. back on the bus and come back home. My mom never knew that. Oh, but I yeah, the transition was, it, it was, let's say this, the music that they were playing in the, uh, uh, in the cafeteria was no Motown. It was no Teddy Pendergrass. Yeah. It was the Beatles. It was, uh, uh, airplane. Yeah. It, it was a whole different culture experience, but I will tell you this. Um, once you get comfortable on both sides of that, yeah. then you can be yourself regardless of what side or what culture, and you can gain an appreciation yeah. of that. And I, I found that to be the case. I think it was, uh, it was it. rewarding. It was rewarding. Let, let me divert from this then. Oakland is known for the Black Panthers. Oh yes, you got some Black Panthers. Do you you know that some Black well, Panther something my, my, going on? Because because you were my, going up in the height of the Black Panthers, I think oh, for the yeah. most part, yeah. right? You, you, you the uh, my they opened up a school, and I can tell you one thing: they believed in protecting the community, and they believed in growing the community. And the first school that they started in Oakland, and I think it was K through. I think it's K through six, I think it was. Well, my nephew was one of the first students there at, at their school, the Black Panther School, right off, right up off of 98th Avenue. 
So uh, yeah, they had their their presence there, and and I tell you something, um, they uh, had a relationship with a lot of other groups, and there was a a, a big uh, uh, prominent motorcycle club there at Open White guys, but they didn't have a problem with Huey P and, and the guys and what they were doing. They 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 actually bought into it. So yeah. <laughs> Because when I got out of the Black Panthers, and I, I you know, I didn't know it, and I know that they, they went national in terms of the efforts, is that they were just saying, we want self-preservation, man. We we, we want to do, you know, we feeding our own kids, y'all not feeding them. We're going to give them a better quality education. And the white man get mad at that. Yeah, they, 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 they didn't want handouts. They said, but just don't get in our way. Right. We have we, we we have a way, and this is what we want to do. Okay, we don't need no handouts. We can be self efficient, self sufficient. Yeah, and really, what they were, they had a strong economic message. There's no question about that. Did you ever okay. see them like um, marching or any of that kind? Oh of yeah, they yeah in East Oakland, yeah East Oakland, no question about it. No question. They had, they had a uh, they had a presence yeah. uh, right right up now where. Um, in the uh, East Oakland area where the BART station is um, off of uh, Fruitvale and that sort of thing. You, they, no question, they had, they had a presence. They had a presence. So did, did, did you hear of, uh, uh, of, 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 of things happening to them though? The, the police raiding the places and whatever else they did well, to bring them down? At, at, at that point in time, I'd have pretty much gone on to college. But yeah, they they knew they were constantly under investigation. FBI, of course, that came out later. I mean, they're all were on on in essence the hit list. They, yes, there was nothing that they couldn't do that the authorities weren't aware of. You know, they they knew they were in danger at all times. You know, did did, did what what didn't what didn't stop you? What stopped you? Or was there some interest on your part to to want to be like that? Did you, I mean, you know what I'm saying? I mean, you were younger or something, maybe, but well, yeah, you know what well, I'm, I guess what I'm asking you. No, no, they, they, well, see that when you're an athlete and you got a talent, okay, uh, and people are drawn to you for that. And I was an athlete and um, that was a way of, um, and as I look back, yeah. and some, some of my buddies, the other thing is that was really critical at that time was Vietnam. I'm gonna tell you something. In the Oakland draft board, they didn't care if you had a, a one S with student and uh, what were some of the other ones? Um, all those draft connotations, they didn't give a hoot about that. If you were draftable age, regardless if you were in college or if you were a sole provider, you got drafted. And I tell you, it was touch and go. Um, I didn't go in the I had asthma and my twin brother, um, he just barely missed his and student deferment. But I tell you something, a lot of those brothers, they during the Vietnam War, they'd be, they'd be the, as soon as they hit 18, there's no question they were going to get drafted. And a lot of them didn't come back. Yeah, yeah. So a lot of them didn't come back. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, um, so this, this inf where do you get to like in Black history then? How did you get to want to do and write this story that you've written? Well, I'm a uh, ex-professional baseball player. And, right. But I'm a historian as well. And in 2004, I was in Manhattan. I was working in New York. And I walked past the newsstand. I saw in the left-hand column of the Wall Street Journal. And the article was entitled, Mystery. Was William Edward White first Black Major League Baseball player? And, you know, having played professionally, knowing about Jackie Robinson, the Fleetwood Brothers, and Josh Gibson, and the Negro Leagues, and then to see a name of William Edward White. My, okay, hold on, let me stop you right there. I mean, who was the Fleetwood Brothers? I've never heard of them. Oh yeah, Fleetwood Brothers, they, they were back in the 1800s, okay? And uh, two brothers, um, major league players, fair skin, uh, more mulatto, okay? Uh, but needless to say, uh, at a point in time, Negroes could play, but not in the major leagues. Right. And they formed their own league. Right. In the Negro leagues. Okay. Right. Which did quite well. Uh, but then it was a double-edged sword when 
Jackie Robinson was signed by the Brooklyn Dodgers in 1946, okay? And that was pretty much an economic thing uh, for the Dodgers and the attendance was down in Major League Baseball and they saw a way uh, to get black folks interested in the game. They were interested in the Major League game, the white That's game. That's right. And so they were, they saw it as a purely, Branch Rickey was a pretty good businessman, you know? So, uh, but, but, but really my interest was spurred on uh, by my baseball interest and in, my interest in, in, in history in that regard. So now, so what's the story? Who, what, who is the guy? Where did he grow up? What, tell us some well, of the story. Uh, uh, well, after I read the article, uh, I reached out to the genealogist that wrote the article, okay? And interviewed him and he said, well, I gotta tell you something. This whole thing about uh, this young fellow that uh, was born as a slave and the slave owner sent him to Brown University, okay? That, I uncovered that purely by accident. He said, I started in the story because my last name is White, okay? And I thought I might be related to Captain A.J. White. Captain A.J. White happened to be a captain in the Confederate Army. He was a railroad industrialist. He had a plantation with more than 70 slaves, very wealthy, okay? And he sent his son, who happened to be a baseball player, to Brown University in 1877. And in 1879, William Everett White played for the Division I Brown University Championship baseball team, okay, mm -hmm. as first baseman. That summer of 1879, he attended a Major League Baseball game in Providence, Rhode Island, between the Providence Grays and the Cleveland Blues. Just prior to the game, the first baseman for the Providence Grays breaks his ankle. They don't have another first baseman on the roster. Okay, hold on. Hold on. No, don't forget where you're at. What, what, now, you say they Providence. There's not a team in Providence. Now, is that still the Major League Baseball, or it's another yeah, league? At that, at that time, that was MLB. That was the National League in, the, in Major League Baseball. The team in Providence was called the Providence Grays, and the team in um, um, uh, the Cleveland Blues of the National League. Okay? The same league as today. Well, yeah, yeah, same oh, league. Okay, as that's today. what I'm getting at. Okay, oh, yeah. I got you. Yeah. I got you. Oh yeah, no, no question. MLB, okay, Major League Baseball, and uh, just prior to the game, uh, the first baseman breaks his ankle. They see this kid they knew had played for Brown, happened to be a first baseman. And they pulled him out of the stand, coached him out of the stands. They signed him to a one-day contract. He played in the game, got four bats, one hit, fielded 12 ground balls. That's all in the annals of baseball history. So from purely a genealogy standpoint, William Everett White is the first slave as well as the first mixed race player to play in the major leagues. Undisputable. And nobody knows who he is. Nobody. He just disappeared. That was the last game he played. Now, interesting, the next game, the person that replaced him, the white guy that replaced him, his name is Jim O'Rourke. He is in the Hall of Fame. So from that, that period on. But he only played one game. He left Brown University the next year in 1880 without getting his degree, which is strange because his dad was paying for his degree. It wasn't a money thing. Uh, my research took me to the uh, NC2A and I asked about him. They said, well, we do show him as a student athlete, but we can't tell if he lost by playing in that game, if he lost his amateur status. My suspicion is either one of a couple things happened. Uh, either he was found out not to be passing and not to, to be black or not to be white. I got you. Because his student enrollment card indicated him as white, okay? His birth certificate indicated him as white, okay? The, let me back up a little bit. Okay. I was early on in my research uh, when I found out that he was uh, born as a slave in Milner, Georgia, which happened to be 50 miles away from where I used to live in Georgia, in Congress. So I asked my grandson, who was 19 at the time, I said, right. I said, hey, I'm doing this research for this book I'm writing. Uh, I'm gonna make a trip to Milne, Georgia. I'd like for you to join me. I need a photographer. He said, well, what are we gonna do? I said, we're gonna go to the cemetery see if we can find the ball player. 
He says, oh, no, Papa, I'm not interested in doing that. I said, no, I really need your help. So he, get, he agrees. We go to the cemetery. And the cemetery is about two miles long. So when we pull up to the cemetery, there's a brother there that's doing the maintenance work and the gardening work. Told him who it was, told him to research. He says, I don't pretty much know too much about that. He says, but the older grave sites are like way out there. And if you free free to go out there and see what you can find. He said, but give me your name. I'll have the cemetery director call you in case you know he can be of some assistance. I said, well, that's great. So we go out there and we walk about a mile out to where the headstones were in the 1700s and early 1800s and voila, we found what we thought was the gravesite of the ball player. Oh, really? so I, it, oh I, I tell you something, it's like, wow, how can this happen? So we're taking pictures and it's in my book. I got my arms around the, the headstone and I'm feeling really good about myself, you know? So we get back in the car, we're headed back to uh, my home in Conyers and I get a call from the cemetery director. He says, hey, I understand that uh, you fellows are out at the cemetery looking for the ball player. I said, yeah, yeah. He says, well, we're familiar with him. We kind of know who he is, but you probably came across the gravesite of Captain A.J. White. I said, yeah, yeah. He said, oh no, that's the dad. <laughs> that's the plantation owner. I said, oh my goodness, I ain't putting that. You had the board. wrong place. <laughs> I, had, I, yeah. had, I, had the, I had the dad. He says, well, then he went, then he said, well, you got to understand, things were a little different back then. I said, well, how so? He says, well, uh, his, his mistress, okay, uh, the slave, her, her name was Hattie, and I had that right in my research. And after he passed, she petitioned the church to allow her to be buried in the gravesite next to him. And the church denied it, even though he gave the land and built the church uh, in Milner, Georgia, Captain A.J. Yeah. White. And he says, she is buried, Hattie is buried in an unmarked grave in the colored cemetery, which is across the road. So you probably didn't get over there. I said, no, I didn't get over there. He said, but I can help you find your ball player. I said, how so? He says, I'm going to send you a link and I think it'll help you. I said, well, I appreciate that. When I got home, uh, opened up my computer and he sent me a link and the link is entitled and any of your viewers can go out and search their history. The link is entitled findagrave.com, findagrave.com. So you go in and all you do is put the person's name in there. You have to have at least the year they were born or the year they died. In this, at that point in my research, I had neither. However, I figured if he was a junior at Brown University, that had to put him about 20. All right. So I backed up, I backed up him being a 20 year old junior at Brown to 1859, voila. I got a death certificate, I got a birth certificate. Oh, really? I got a bio, I got, uh, uh, historical bio, what happened to him after he left Brown and went to Chicago. And uh, he it was pretty, he was living a pretty good life, but something happened. And I think the something is, because he had a family, uh, but at the end, he was disowned by his family. Um, he died in 1937, slipped on a slippery curve, died of hypothermia in 1937. So, uh, and at that point he was living in a uh, flop house uh, in Chicago. So things had turned pretty rough for him. But from the period of time, 1880 to 1937, he was just undercover. So, did, so he never was able to take this and play for the Negro League? Nope, nope. And, and that's, that's kind of interesting. My research, along with what I found out from the genealogist, he never showed back up. He left Brown, uh, went to Chicago. Uh, his profession was listed on the census, the 1910 census and the 1920 census as, as being a draftsman. And his race was indicating as white, not black. So, so he still went, he went back after the white thing, I guess. So. Yeah, that's, that is true. 
That is true. Yeah. But I, I think something happened and, and he was discovered. The only interview that I've been able to uncover of a family member was his great, great granddaughter. And she gave an interview and the interview was questioning her, did she know of him? And she said, no, but she said, and this was her exact word. She said, I do know this. If my great, great grandmother would have known he was black, she would have kicked him out. So at that point, I really didn't have an interest in reaching out to her for interviews, but the family, the, the, uh, the white family, AJ White uh, was related in, to royalty in, in England. So they're a very prominent family um, in, uh, in England. And then he was a slave owner and a military guy in the Confederate Army. What, okay, uh, uh, maybe I got this. Was, her, was his wife white? Mm-mm. But, but, she, but, but what, what the daughter said yes. was if, if yes. she would have known yes. that he was black, she wouldn't have wanted him? No, 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 no. Yeah. Oh, his wife, yes. Captain, uh, 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 his wife, in Chicago was white. The whole, the whole lineage there was on the, on the white side, okay? And in my book, I have photos of him while he was in college. Now, of course, they're black and white. And um, uh, the storyline kind of gives you a sense of, of, you know, how he was able to pass, all right? Uh, but um, yeah, his family in Chicago was white, no question. So when when they pulled him out of the stands, they thought they were pulling a white guy. Oh, ain't no question about that. Oh, oh about that. I okay. okay well, well okay. Let, let, me, let me say this, Anthony, and I stumbled on this, but it is well known now. Okay, that Brown University was heaped in the slave trade. Several of the governors at Brown University, regents and governors of Brown, were slave ship owners. And it wasn't uncommon if they had a fair skinned kid that was born of one of their slaves, they would slip them in the brown and they pay all the tuition and you know, certain things were being granted to them because Brown was get, had a revenue stream and had monetized in the slave industry. Now, that's not a history that they talk a lot about, but that I'm is- sure. And in fact, the case, yeah. Where, where is Brown University? Uh, Brown University is in Providence, Rhode Island. Providence, Rhode Island, okay. Yeah. Is it an yeah. Ivy League school? They call it that? Yeah, oh yeah. Oh yeah, very, very much Ivy League. Just as Princeton and, and Harvard and Yale. Yeah, very okay. Ivy League. Okay. And, and so uh, have you been able to tell this to Major League Baseball? And oh, are yeah. they gonna come, I mean, are they gonna do something with this story? Well, I've had conversations um, directly with uh, Bob Kendricks, and I think you know him as well. Yeah. He's the CEO of the Negro League Museum in Kansas City. And um, well, I kind of touch on it in my book. Um, there's not a whole lot of interest in, in that particular thing because Major League Baseball, they have their Jackie Robinson. The, the, subtitle, the subtitle of my book, and I, I, I kind of got it here. Yeah, yeah, the jersey. Can't yeah. see the subtitle. The, the subtitle is The Mysterious Disappearance of Bill White, Amer America Baseball's First Jackie Robinson. Okay. See, Jackie Robinson did so much uh, for not only the, the uh, athletic, but the social movement and the pressure that he was under to perform. And see, Jackie Robinson was a college graduate, a football player at UCLA, a yeah. uh, military officer uh, that uh, was kicked out of the army because he refused to move on the back of a bus and uh, was dishonorably in uh, discharged. Yeah. So Jackie yeah. Robinson was a very accomplished athlete and very social activist. Uh, and the movie 42 it, uh, certainly imparts that, okay? That's that's a good movie. They did a really good job of that. Yeah. Have you been able to get this information to the folks at the Jackie Robinson Foundation? Uh, well, let's say this. I know Bob Kendricks and I have talked about it. Um, see, what what I'm sensitive to 
and I tell my audience and anybody that reads my book, uh, the fact that William Edward White is the first slave in the first mixed race has, uh, does not distract at all one iota from what Jackie Robinson was able to accomplish. Yeah, sure. See, Jackie Robinson, uh, what he had to endure, and see, I played minor league baseball. I played in those small towns, Waterloo, Davenport, Fox City. And when you go in those towns, I mean, there may be, and I was playing in the early 70s. I mean, there may be one restaurant that you felt comfortable in eating at. Oh, really? Okay. The, ho the hotels were not, uh, the hotels and the bus trips. See, there's a lot of great baseball players that never got to the major leagues because of, you know, the conditions they had to endure in the minor leagues. They didn't want, they didn't want to put up with it, okay? Plus, you weren't going to get paid a whole lot anyway. So. Yeah, sure. yeah you, were, you were purely playing for the love of the game and the hope that you would get to the big, big leagues, you know? Yeah. What, so. what, what year did Jackie Robinson get into the big league? 47. Okay, 47. What, what, what year did they, did they say, uh, and I got it in the book, I just don't know, that the, that the height of the Negro Baseball Leagues is what decades, years, what have you? Uh, well, it, uh, from the, uh, how can I say, 30, 34 to 51, okay? But the height, I mean, at, at the height of the uh, Negro League, in when they played in major league stadiums, like in Cleveland, yeah, or I Chicago, heard they, they out they outdrew the white teams. And when they played uh, these barnstorming games, uh, when Satchel Page and then went on the road in 1937, uh, they were outdrawing the major league teams. And they, when they played the major league teams, uh, you know, they it, it was incredible. The, how much of a draw that they had. And they played a different brand of baseball. You know, uh, Ken Burns in his series, uh, documentary series called Baseball, where he did 10 innings and each inning is two hours. I had an opportunity to meet him in Buck O'Neill when they, because I was with uh, my career, executive career was with General Motors and we sponsored pretty much all of Ken Burns' uh, documentaries. And in his documentary, he, he designates at least two hours uh, to what happened to the Negroes uh, coming into and out of baseball uh, from the standpoint of major leagues, minor leagues. But from an economic standpoint, uh, the majority of the Negro League teams were owned by white folks, okay? Yeah, I and, heard that too. And, and, and a lot of that was funded by some somewhat illegal activities. <laughs> okay. okay. But um, uh, needless okay. to say, they were very from a social, um, economic. It was it was a driver in a lot of those cities where those teams were located. It was a, it was an economic driver, and when Jackie uh, Robinson um, entered into the major leagues in 1947, and soon thereafter, Larry Doby and uh, uh, Roy Campanella, uh, when those guys, they the major league teams started picking those guys out of the minor leagues. Then Satchel Page came in uh, to the Cleveland. Satchel Page probably was mid to late forties pitching for the uh, uh, Cleveland Indians. In his first two games he pitched in the major leagues, he threw shutouts. Uh, you know, it, it was, so that league got diluted by 1951. It was pretty much the talent had been diluted, and then yeah. I think '54, I think probably dissolved at that point. Which when, was when, besides Jackie, did did Jackie go from the minor league to, to the major league? Uh, yeah, he, did he go he played, straight he from played in, wherever no, no, to he the played major in Mont league? He played in Montreal, and they figured that Montreal would be kind of a uh, interesting place to start him. Okay. In the major league level, though. No, no, no. He, no, when he signed professionally, when he signed his contract with uh, the Los Angeles Dodgers, they sent him to Montreal. So he played in Montreal. Be, and I think he played a full season or a season and a half. And then they brought him up to the big club in uh, 1947. And then in that same year, the latter part of that year, I'm going to say, um, um, who was it? I believe Cleveland. 
uh, Larry Doby came in. So they were, a lot of people don't realize that he came in in that same year oh. to play them. Did, yeah. did most of them, when they started though, did they start them in the farm club or they came oh, back yeah. to? Oh yeah, all of them. Um, well, let's say this though. Ernie Banks, when he came in, they took him right from the Negro Leagues and as a 19 year old, put him in the major leagues with the Chicago Cubs. So Ernie Banks was a novelty because uh, shortstops typically didn't hit home runs at that time. Yeah. And Ernie, Ernie Banks could hit 30, 40 home runs as a shortstop, okay, in his, in his career. And then he ended up playing first base. But um, yeah, most majority of uh, players all went through the minor league system, okay? Hank Aaron went through the minor league system. Yeah, they all played a little time in the minor leagues, yeah. Uh, the other, the, uh, in another video, we, when we talk about that, I guess Bob Kendrick or otherwise, um, there was a team that played like the bingo long all-stars. Because mm -hmm. uh, somehow we kind of got the impression, I did, and let me speak for myself, that with the bingo long all-stars kind of made it feel like that was the norm. But that there was a team like that. Do you know that story? Well, well, basically what it was, they were barnstormers. So what would happen is, uh, in in the classic cases, uh, Satchel Page in 1937, Satchel Page got a was contacted by the uh, uh, prime minister or whatever the title was uh, of the uh, of uh, the dictator in the Dominican Republic. And he said, well, Satchel, I'm going to send you a check for $29,000. I need you to bring a team because I want to win the Caribbean uh, Major League, um, the Caribbean uh, World Tournament. So Satchel uh, put a team together, and they went over there and won, okay? The next season, they got another invite to come back. But at that point in time, the dictator, and I think it was uh, – I've got it in the book, Raphael, uh, the dictator there um, now started to uh, doing some things that concerned Satchel as to the uh, human uh, human aspect of uh, how they were treating his own people. So they right. didn't go back. But then Satchel Page uh, was suspended and those players that went with him, they were suspended for a half a season from the Negro League. So what they did, they formed this team and they would travel around and play in these towns. Oh, really? They had some good ball clubs. They had some good ball clubs. Yeah, no question about it. So they were they were the barnstormers. So a lot that bingo along situation was kind of like they go into a town, uh, have a field. The town would put together some local folks, and and they split the team up, and <laughs> play three or four games, and that sort of thing. Oh, okay. Yeah. No now, question. Um... The the uh, but then also he says, and you alluded to just a second ago, a lot of the players made more money overseas. Uh, yeah, no question. Yeah, Major League Baseball until we got a lot of you know you only had when TV was black and white, you only had one game in a week, and majority of those players had jobs in the off season. You know, so it wasn't a big a big salary type type situation. So they had other other careers to make a living to support their families because half the season you're on the road. Okay. Now the team, when you're, when you're traveling, the team covers your expenses in hotels or whatever. But uh, even today, uh, when you're at home and the major league schedule is 162 games, yeah. you know, for 80, 81 of those games, you're paying for your own lodging in whatever town your team is located. You know, majority of those players don't, reside in the town that they play. Yeah, 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 sure. Now the picture you have behind you, what is that? Well, that is a, um, that is, uh, the artist is Kadir Nelson, very prominent art, artist. He did a whole book on the Negro League. Uh, the number 20 uh, that you see in that picture, that's Josh Gibson. And let me see now. Yeah. Uh, let me go over here. Uh, you can't see. Well, on the mound, uh, pitching is Satchel Page, and that's a very one of his favorite favorite paintings. I have, I happen to own that painting as well. Uh, but he did a book of all of his uh, uh, pictures. Okay, it's kind of interesting. 
uh, I was kind of naive. I approached him to do the cover for my book. And his agent got back, he was very gracious. He says, well, it sounds like a good idea. It's a great story. Yeah, I said, he said, I think uh, Kadir would like to do that. He says, well, what's your budget? Yeah, I got <laughs> so, it. When he said budget, I said, well, maybe, you know, so I was out of my league because this yeah. guy is been yeah. a company. Very accomplished artist. Yeah. But 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 in your book, do you have a picture of the of the guy? You, you, the, the, uh, oh yeah. I'm working on a project right now uh, that I'm very excited about because it's based on a um, a historical event that took place in 1967 when Martin Luther King spoke at Barrett Junior High School uh, six months prior to his assassination. And he spoke to this, the middle school, the junior high school kids and faculty, and he gave a famous speech. And I don't know if you've heard it, it's called Blueprint. And I posted uh, on Martin Luther King Day, I posted uh, the aspects of this speech. Well, I picked up that day, and this is what, a week ago Monday? I picked up an article that was written in 2018 regarding Martin Luther King speaking at this middle school, okay? And in the article, they named five brothers that were in the audience. I reached out to the author. I said, by the way, are these individuals still alive? He says, four of which are still alive. I said, boy, I would really like, because my book, I'm writing about uh, that his attendance here and I will just give you a sneak preview. Yeah. One of, in the book, uh, one of the students, uh, 40 years later, goes on to win a Nobel Prize. And I chronicle that individual. He's one of the characters in my new book, which is entitled Blueprint. So in any event, I reached out to these four guys. Okay. Anthony, you're not gonna believe it. I tracked them all down. One guy ended up being the CEO of the YMCA of North America. Another guy played in the NBA, uh, went to UCLA, played in the NBA. Another guy was an executive with Cigna and Metro and Life. And another guy was a tailor. And his story was so fascinating. I, I couldn't write quick enough because he says, hey, I attended the speech. I was in there and I'm a, I was a gang kid. And when I came in with my gang buddies, they said, you can't come in, you gotta have a tie on. So they said, you gotta go to the janitor's room, get one of them ties and bring yourself back here. He said, so when I came back, I couldn't sit with my gang buddies. I had to sit on the end of the road. He said, but something came over when I heard those words about setting up a blueprint for your life and, and you know, be who you are, be the yeah. best you can, you're gonna be a, a, a street fleet sweeper, be the best street sweeper ever. Right. And he says, he says, I could be myself. He said, from that moment on, he says, I couldn't get out the gang because they'd have killed me. He says, so I started doing less gang things <laughs> so, yeah. and more school things. Yeah. He said, I used to like the saying. He said, man, Teddy Pendergrass. Huh? He says, so he says, I figured that. Maybe that might be the way to get out. And man, just a fascinating story. So yeah. those four guys is what they were on to accomplish. That here, here they are 50 years later that are still, their comments still resonate about that experience being sure. in that room. And one, one of the guys said, he said, man, I'm sitting there. He says, and I'm five rows from the stage. And they said, it's like Jesus Christ stepped on the stage. Damn. I mean, it was, it was, he says, I I he said, and one guy, the gang member guy, he says, well, yeah, I kind of knew who he was and I know he was doing some civil rights stuff, but I didn't know really who he was. Yeah. He said, when he started talking and he said, you could hear a pin drop. He said, usually when you go to an assembly at a middle school, yeah, a lot of messing around. Oh, sure, sure. He said, but I want to tell you something. You could hear a pin drop. He said, but the guy says, when he said, he said, the line that really got me, he says, he says, I got to get you all to be thinking, get away from burn, baby, burn, to earn, baby, earn, mm -hmm. okay? And, and when, he, when he said that, okay, he says, 
you know, I was a singer and all the songs back then and had baby. As soon as he yep. said that baby, yep. it caught me. It caught me. And yeah, just fascinating. So I'm I'm working on that project now. That's it's beautiful. Called, it's called Blueprint, man. Yeah, all right. Well, we we gonna have yeah, man, you come back on anytime. <laughs> you know how that goes. <laughs> you know, when that come out, we come out. Now, how do people get your book? How do people get your well, book? Well, uh, you can go to alvinstream.com. Okay. Alvinstream.com, A-L-V-I-N Stream, S-T-R-A-N-E dot com. Okay. That's my website. Right. I've got uh, several um uh Podcast I've done that's on there. Uh, you can order t shirt you can order the book. Yeah. Uh, the the other can, thing that has happened, uh, and I just I just came to mind is that now Major League Baseball is including the statistics of the Negro League players. Yes, yes. I was on a podcast shortly after it was announced, and it's kind of interesting. Um, that's a kind of a double edged sword here a little bit. Okay. Okay. Uh, one, uh, they should have been included, okay? The however is because of the length of the seasons and the, the games, the chronicling of the games, okay? Sometimes the statistics get kind of blended a little bit. I got uh, you. So there, there's guys uh, that play the Negro Leagues that their statistics would match up uh, superior uh, to some of the, you know, there's some brothers that played in the Negro Leagues that hitting 400. All right. Now, Ty Cobb, I mean, not Ty Cobb, uh, uh, Ted, uh, Ted Williams is the, uh, the last player in the major leagues uh, to hit over 400. But there, there are guys like Josh Gibson hitting 50 and 60 home runs, okay, at big, huge ballparks, okay, yeah. that uh, those statistics should have been included in that. Yeah, yeah we we well, had some discussion on that. I I, I just uh, you know, it hurt my heart uh, that uh, Buck O'Neill, who really was a staunch supporter of making that happen, uh, should have been in the Hall of Fame. He was a great player in the Negro Leagues. He was a manager for the Monarchs, and should have been uh, inducted into the Hall of Fame some time ago. He will be inducted this July. Okay, the Veterans, the Veterans Committee. Uh, Buck O'Neill, so we're real proud of that. Yeah, good. Yeah. Well, hey, yeah. I, th I thank you for coming on the channel uh, oh, man, and, and sharing this. Uh, everybody, did, did I tell you we had a winner here? Oh my God! And 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 it, it's a little known fact. That's really what it is. I uh, true. It's true. a little known fact that that has been uncovered, and the, and the documentation to prove it is there. No question. They, they want to get in the gray area of they thought he was white or whatever. At the end of the day, he didn't trick them. He just was sitting there. No question. Now, now let me tell you this, Anthony. Yeah. And I know we're closing this out. It's really interesting um, as to the reaction as I was putting my final uh, final text together. The reaction I got when I said, well, there's probably a reason why because he was passing. And they say, oh, well, all right, yeah, all right, yeah, he just deleted his race. I, I say, well, well, hold up, hold, hold up, let me, let me just share this with you. Um, given the opportunity, okay, all right, he went to Brown, dad set that up, okay? So now he's at Brown. So there are a couple options. He can leave Brown and go back to the plantation, okay, uh, to either pick cotton or to be the house nigger, right. okay? Or, he might want to maybe if it is a position open that he can provide for his family. Now, what, what would you do? Because quite honestly, um, those individuals who were doing that passing, they cut themselves off completely. And the genealogist who did the interviews uh, in uh, on this as well, he said when he left, when uh, William Weber White left to go to Brown, never was heard of again, never contacted his mom, never reached out to any of his other family members, just completely cut off. Okay. And that's what had to be done. Wow. Okay. We're going to end on that note, everybody. All right, my man. I got no more questions right. to tell you the truth. Uh, <laughs> hit the subscribe button, my friends. Hit the like button on this video. I know you like it.
you can't help but like this one, like you like all the others, but for sure. Uh, hit the uh, notifications bell, tell somebody about strong inspirations. And to you, my brother, I say this with all sincerity. I want you to stay strong, stay safe, stay on your grind. I, I, I like that you come up with these stories. Did you find, that's your niche. Yeah. It's coming I, I up with something that, that, and, and you know, that, that's out of the realm of what other people have uh, really thought of, investigated. And then you came up with this one because you were just looking at the newspaper and on the sideline, you that's saw all. it and ran with it. It uh, piqued your curiosity. And we are happy that you did. Everybody go and get his book on his website. And then the that's an autograph. It's a good book, good thick book, well written, and all that other stuff. And uh, so, with that, I'll say bye bye. We out. Have a good one. Thanks. Beautiful. Beautiful. Thank you so much. All right.